This is Jarrell, a central Texas town that was the site of one of the most intense tornadoes ever documented. In the short list of tornadoes rated in F5, the highest tornado rating, perhaps none are as legendary and mythical. Adding to its status, no other violent tornado has formed under such a strange set of meteorological circumstances. It's been labeled repeatedly as a meteorological accident. What was revealed after years of study would make Gerald one of the most fascinating violent tornado cases in all of meteorology. In the days leading up to May 27, 1997, the Southern Plains saw the alignment of the four main environmental ingredients needed for the formation of tornadoes. The area was being baked at the surface with cooler temperatures overhead, creating instability, the first main ingredient. The jet stream, the main driver of the key ingredients, wind shear and lift, brought a belt of flow across Kansas and Oklahoma. This strong flow allowed for the formation of an area of low pressure at the surface over Kansas that would drift southward. The surface low adds to the wind shear while also pulling moisture from the gulf northward, the last missing piece of the puzzle. With the four key ingredients aligned to the north of central Texas, multiple days of severe weather and tornadoes would take place. By the morning of the 27th, days of collecting moisture and instability over central Texas were being contained by an elevated mixed layer, or EML. An EML is a warm and dry air mass that is keeping surface-based air from breaching into the unstable air above. Well to the north of Gerald in Fort Worth, meteorologists launch a weather balloon to record the atmospheric parameters in place that morning. Even at 7 a.m., instability was rather high at 2,700 joules per kilogram. This value would be even higher further to the south as none of that energy has been able to be dissipated via thunderstorms. 27th differed compared to the prior few days. Moving into central Texas were two primary boundary features. Most obvious was a cold front oriented northeast to southwest. Even though upper level winds were still relatively weak, this front can push through the EML, allowing for surface-based air to explode into the instability. Just ahead of the cold front paralleling it was a dry line. Dry lines are sharp boundaries separating dry and moist air masses. With time, this cold front would catch up and eventually overtake the dry line and smash into the moist, highly unstable air. Despite still lacking wind shear with the jet stream flow well to the north, the extreme instability alone and oncoming cold front warranted a 3 out of 4 risk from the storm prediction center that morning. Development of supercell thunderstorms the storm type responsible for most tornadoes was not obvious at this time. What also is not obvious is your exposed IP address. Let me take a minute to discuss today's video sponsor, Private Internet Access, the world's most transparent VPN provider. While I'm on the road chasing storms, I'm constantly logging into public hotel Wi-Fi networks, but doing so without encryption is like me sending a private message to the world. Anybody can see it. As you browse unprotected, Information is being exchanged with the websites you visit out in the open, which can be viewed by any entities with the know-how. Private Internet Access shields your IP address in browsing to the outside internet, encrypting your life from the eyes of parties like your internet service provider, network administrators, or even the folks that I'm sharing public hotel Wi-Fi with. Private Internet Access's client works across all platforms and operating systems with one subscription covering an unlimited amount of devices at the same time, which is great for me as a storm chaser with loads of devices. With servers all around the US and the globe, you can even find different releases on your favorite streaming services as what's available isn't universal worldwide. I was actually just able to rewatch Twisters on Netflix logged into Japan's server. June 1st viewers can get an 83% discount plus 4 months free for private internet access using my link in the description below. Thank you to private internet access for sponsoring this video, now let's get back into the storm. Another feature soon entered the equation. The prior day's storms over Oklahoma had congealed into a mesoscale convective system, or MCS. As this large complex of thunderstorms exploded upward into the atmosphere, air around the complex rippled outward like a stone thrown into water. These ripples are called gravity waves. 
Most importantly, a gravity wave could provide just enough lift ahead of the cold front to have a storm fire off of the dry line. At noon local time, a gravity wave provided enough lift for a cumulus tower to breach the eroding elevated mixed layer near the Texan city of Waco. As the storm rooted and tapped into the extreme instability, the weak upper level flow was unable to drive the storm eastward further into the primed air mass. Additionally, severe thunderstorms need to have stronger flow aloft in order to vent their cool downdrafts away from their updrafts that are ingesting the primed air. The storm over Waco should in theory not last long. However, the cold front was just now overtaking the dry line along the storm's rear flank. New updrafts were now being forced upward. The once near stationary storm was now able to backbuild, propagating in an unusual southwesterly direction. This storm was still not ready to produce tornadoes. Lacking wind shear failed to rotate the storm's updraft. To achieve supercell thunderstorm status, the extreme instability needed to effectively tilt vorticity into the vertical. Vorticity is often maximized along boundaries as differing air masses interact. Storm updrafts tilt this vorticity into the vertical, but can vary in efficiency depending on the environmental instability and wind shear. Shortly before 1 p.m., the Storm Prediction Center issued a tornado watch for the area, driven by the extreme instability present in the area. Damaging wind gusts and large hail were still the primary concern based on the watch discussion. Instability was nearing 7,000 joules per kilogram. For reference, anything over 4,000 is considered very high. The storm near Waco became a vorticity ingesting machine, very efficiently tilting vorticity along the boundary to allow the storm to become a supercell despite the lack of wind shear. Further adding to the quirks of this storm, the tornado genesis process was also atypical. What allowed for their formation were distortions of storm scale gust front features. Downdrafts from the storm create their own localized boundary features in the form of gust fronts. Vorticity is once again maximized at the boundary and new updrafts triggered by the cold front tap into the extreme instability. The boundary's vorticity is now stretched so efficiently into the vertical, tornado genesis occurs outside of the parent storm's mesocyclone, the main rotating updraft. These tornadoes started their lives as land spouts. Just to the northwest of the village of Prairie Dell, at 3.07 p.m., the Gerald Tornado began as a landspout tornado, originating from a fledgling flanking updraft. For the first 18 minutes of its life, it rode the gust front of the main storm, existing as a spindly rope no wider than a couple dozen yards. Farm fields and tree lines would have F1 damage afflicted upon them before 3.25 p.m., when just north of Gerald, the landspout's updraft met the mesocyclone of the parent storm, which lay at the cusp of an intersecting gust front. The ensuing cell merger allowed for vortex aggregation, making the landspout now a proper mesocyclonic tornado. With the full support of the parent storm's unlocked instability, rapid intensification occurred. The famous dead man walking image from Scott Beckwith is a haunting look into this intensification process unfolding. The tornado's path now deviated as it followed the propagating mesocyclone's motion. The southwestern turn steered the staggering tornado towards the northwest corner of Gerald, where the Double Creek Estates neighborhood lay. Unlike typical supercells that move translationally with the upper level winds, this propagating storm moved at a relative crawl. Forward tornado motion was at a near standstill when the tornado overtook Double Creek Estates, coincidentally with peak maturity. The resulting damage would be some of the most intense ever documented. Most notable was the lack of debris left behind. Reanalysis of Gerald suggests that this vortex was over the neighborhood for a nightmarishly long three to four minutes. Debris of all varieties from Double Creek Estates is either scattered about or even granulated beyond recognition. While the majority of people were not home, 27 lives were lost in Double Creek Estates. At 3.53 local time, the Gerald tornado concluded three miles west of town as the gust front cusp pinched off the mesocyclone from the surface. This would be the last tornado produced by this particular cell complex, 
as the cold front completely overtook the dry line, unzipping a whole new batch of storms. In total, 17 tornadoes were spawned in central Texas by this storm system. When the dust settled, re-examination of the raw environmental parameters in place over Gerald that day revealed that when plugged into the parameter calculations of supercell composite and significant tornado, both fell into the non-supercellular range. The complete lack of wind shear and traditional supercellular mechanisms made it seem meteorologically impossible for violent tornadoes. Key lessons learned from the Gerald event were that extremely high instability and well-placed boundaries can more than make up for lacking ingredients. Plus, small convective cells ahead of a propagating storm can become tornadic along a gust front where vorticity can be stretched into the vertical. While extremely rare, Gerald was a stark reminder that even a less than ideal environment can become deadly if the right details fall into place.